Hey guys, welcome to Hope It Helps. And my guest on the show today is Mr. Omar Shahab. Omar, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. So, Omar, as we were talking earlier, I found out about you through a friend of mine and that you're the founder of Boca. And I saw all the work you do surrounding restaurants and stuff uh, and growing up here. So you probably have a good grasp on the industry here and so on. And I haven't had anyone involved in the food and beverage mm -hmm. on the show, at least in this kind of perspective. So I thought it'd be super interesting to talk to you and discuss all things to do with that. But before we get into all the nitty gritty details, why don't you give all of us just a little bit of background about yourself and we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Omar and I was born and brought up here in the city, in Dubai. My parents moved from uh, Jordan in the late 70s. Uh, myself and my two, uh, my two sisters were, were both, were all uh, born and brought up here. Went to school, university, uh, and immediately started, uh, started working. Uh, my, first, my first role my first job was actually um, in, in IT, IT um, in, in the economic side of IT. So I worked for an American company that, uh, that put together numbers and, and research figures uh, that set the standard for the industry. Um, I worked for a company called IDC, and I was responsible, uh, along with obviously a, a fabulous group of people, uh, of setting up their Middle East and Africa and, and Turkey operations. And that was a really, really exciting time of my life. Um, I don't know if something that we we, sh we should dig in, but you know, I'm yeah, happy to talk share. about this yeah, because yeah, sure. I, I see my um, I see my background in the time that I was working there and the time that I made the shift into what I'm doing right now. So I spent almost ten years, and like I said, I was responsible for setting up the operations um, okay. along with 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 the with, with the team, of course. So I spent uh, the first couple of years in Dubai setting up things for their Middle East operations. We we were basically doing research on the ground for our clients, where the likes, where the Microsofts and the Dells and the okay. IBMs of the world. Yeah. Um, and then expanding into Africa, and I must say that that has been definitely one of the highlights of my career, uh, the time that I spent in in the African continent. So I was uh, with the team that set up bases. In, uh, in, in the major regions, so Casablanca in the north, uh, Lagos in, uh, for, for the west, and Nairobi okay. for east, and obviously Johannesburg for, for the south. So I spent a lot of time satelliting between these offices, and then um, spent some time obviously back and forth uh, to Dubai, into Istanbul, which was another base for us, and then Prague in the Czech Republic, which was our headquarters for the region. Oh wow! So that, that that's that's what I did. That's what I did yeah. for almost uh, for the for five years um, onwards. And then when when things were set up, I was obviously responsible for managing the team remotely, uh, and I was assigned on site with government projects here in the Gulf. So th those were the last two years that I spent with that with that company. Yeah. yeah. And when did you start making the trans? Because I know your background is as a consultant and director. So how did you make the transition into hospitality and food and beverage? Did you always have a passion for it? Was it an industry that always excited you? Walk us through like that transition. So I think it starts off with um, kind of a typical background. So I've always been interested in, uh, in, in, the f in food, in, in culture in gastronomy in general. Um, I know my way around the kitchen, but that obviously wasn't the reason why I started this. This was not uh, plan A or B or even C. Okay. So during the last two years of, uh, of, of, my, of, my, uh, of my work with my previous company, I decided that I need to shift. It's been already around 10 years. So I decided I, need, I needed to shift, I needed a break. Uh, I wasn't sure where I wanted to step from that point onwards. Do I continue being in research? Do I continue? Um, do I jump to, you know, keep with my with my current path? Do I jump to a client side? I wanted a fresh start. Yeah. So that's why I thought going into a full time uh, immersive MBA program would be something that would help me on that stepping that, stone yeah, and, and make that transition. Mm. And that's exactly what I did. Okay. So I set my mind to uh, a few top programs. And unfortunately, I was not, um, I was not accepted into the one that I wanted uh, in London, but I had two very good uh, other options. Uh, I had the option of either going to Phoenix in Arizona or Cape Town in South Africa. Okay. And obviously, it was an easy decision for me because um, Cape Town and South Africa is a place that I, you know, I, I, I hold very dearly in, in, uh, for me. 
Um, it's a place that I spent some time uh, in. I have great friends down there. So that was a very easy decision, obviously. And also the, the, the proximity to Dubai was something that was important for me. Sure. And that's what I did. So I uh, quit my job. Uh, and I only had one job at, at that time. That was my first job straight out of university. Like 10 years, right? <laughs> exactly. Wow. wow. Okay. Um, so uh, I quit with my mindset on this one year. I had a plan in place. I booked a place down there. Um, and I was about to leave. Uh, I paid my deposit and everything. Uh, at that time, my father was fighting cancer for two years already. Okay. And um, he was going back and forth to Jordan. He had already retired. He was going back and forth to Jordan to, to get treatment. And um, that was the year when things got really heavy on him. Okay. And it was also the time that I had a couple of months off in between my previous job and from the time that I needed to obviously go down to, to the Cape. So I decided that this is a great time to spend time with him. Sure. Um, and that's what I did. So I spent, you know, I, I traveled to Jordan with him. Uh, and that would have been, that was the last, the last two months of his life. Um, oh, wow. And it happened at the very time when I was supposed to be there for orientation. So obviously it was a, it was a quick decision for me. I, I obviously corresponded with the university and asked them to delay my acceptance while I deal with all of this. And that's sure. exactly what happened. So I stayed back in Jordan after his, um, after his death, obviously deal with you know, all, everything, everything, right? Yeah. Um, admin, paperwork, all that stuff. And then I came back. And I came back and now I have this time off. I knew that I wasn't going back to my previous job. I knew that I wanted to move forward. Um, I started picking up projects um, with contacts that I have. I started interviewing for possible, uh, possible employment. Um, but still, in, 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 the, in the back of my mind, I wanted to, to go to, you know, to, to, to Cape Town, yeah. right? But that wasn't going to happen until a year later. Um, at that time, my family, um, they had uh, investments here in the IFC. So they had already invested in an FMB concept. So one of the things that I picked up was I uh, volunteered to spend time in the restaurant that was, that was here in DIFC. Yeah. Um, with obviously no return, no real promise to take it anywhere from, from that point onwards. But obviously, typical me, I got really involved. Uh, I got knees deep into it. Yeah. I started... Um, you know, negotiating on, on their behalf, started talking to everyone that is involved in the logistics of a restaurant, from suppliers to landlords to authorities to um, franchise owners. It was a franchise at the time. Uh, I traveled back and forth to, to Venice to kind of um, bring back the concept back to its root and develop it in a way that would fit and kind of, you know, improve things that were working. Um, Still, you know, I was spending most of my time doing this, uh, mentally and physically. Uh, yet, in my in the back of my my mind, I thought that oh, I'm just doing this part time while I. So, um, obviously, in in the lead up to that, so if you just pause there, if in the lead up to that, um, yeah. when I came back from Jordan, uh, a friend of mine that I that I uh, worked with, he was based out of London. Okay. And he said, listen, dude, why don't you take some time off, come and see me. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a big uh, food lover as well. So we share a lot of uh, common interests. So he said, why don't you come over? Uh, my girlfriend and her mom are out of town and we'll spend time together then in the house. So that's what I did. Um, booked us in some, you know, fabulous restaurants. Um, they also own a house in a small place uh, in Umbria okay. called Spello. So they have a massive house there. So it was just him and I and this big Italian mama that would come in every day with produce and she would cook for us or we would cook something. We'd travel around, you know, in a small car between different villages. So we spent, I spent almost a month doing that. So that was really good for me to, to clear my head and sure. kind of think about what I want to do. And I knew, and this is why, and this is probably the precursor to me getting involved is that I wanted to approach things with a way more open heart. I've been with one company for almost 10 years. I never thought about jumping ship. Mm. Um, that's something, that loyalty, I think, inherited from, from my dad and 
from from that side of the family. Um, so so I, I knew that this time I wanted to approach life differently and sure. keep all of my options open. Yeah. Um, yes, that you know I was I was planned to go to Cape Town and and finish that MBA. It wasn't even going to be a year. It was going to be almost nine months. But I thought that uh, you know this is the time to sort of keep my options open and, and see where this would take me. So that was also partly why I, I approached the family to um, to get involved in, in in the restaurant business. Yeah. Um, this is obviously this is my wife's part, side of the family. These, these are my in-laws. Um, yeah. So I got knees deep. I got really involved uh, up to a point. So it's been I already spent six to nine months nine months okay. doing this. And the time came that it w- that the the contract, the franchise contract with the owners, were up for renewal. And this is me again going in and saying, you know what, we're working against the tide here. We have done you know tremendous work, great work in terms of putting the brand back on track. Okay. It was very difficult to work with the franchise owners because first of all they were coming from a an extreme, extremely luxury background from a place that exists in a city that does not really need um, any marketing. It's a totally different clientele that they have there mm. in Venice. It's obviously 100% tourists. Um, while here in DIFC, things are a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, there were many elements that were not working. Although we really tried to be extremely creative in terms of developing a menu offering that would fit the clientele here, but would also be in line with the brand. Yeah, and what they, what they wanted as well. Exactly. So we tried all of that. We tried uh, re-starting um, PR and marketing in a way that would also fit the brand and would fit, obviously, um, uh, the clientele here. But it was just way too difficult. We were just swimming against the tide. Yeah. So that's when I started doing my research and uh, put together a proposal to the owner saying that we might uh, we might have a chance. First of all, they had the appetite to reinvest okay. and they had intent to keep this going. So that's the first thing that obviously I established. So from that point onwards, I put together a bit of research onto what could work here in the IFC, in this yeah. zone, yeah. Um, in this location, what kind of cuisine was missing what kind of offering what kind of experience was missing yeah so that's that's really how the whole story started yeah how everything came together yeah it's so interesting that it was never you never planned for it but you know that how things kind of worked out in such a way that it gave you the opportunity to really get into the industry and to understand Mm -hmm. it and have like like you said get your knees you know your hands dirty yes before like you make such a like that kind of decision um when I was, what I was thinking about is, as we know, Dubai is probably one of the most saturated <laughs> markets in terms of like food and beverage and restaurants and so on. So, but you guys have been going for eight years. That's rare. That's not, there's very, you can probably count on like your hand how many restaurants have survived past like five years. It's very transient. People, mm. people come in, they try a big concept, it doesn't work, they, and they leave. So how, do you, how have you guys been able to stand out in such a saturated market and in quite a competitive area such as the IFC as well? You're absolutely right. And I'll pick up now on the the story and the history. So it all started with that research. It wasn't really because I enjoy Spanish cuisine or I love a certain style of service. Or we, It started with, first of all, a belief that the restaurants that were doing what they were doing on that fine dining scene, on that high luxury level, are obviously doing a great job um and that's that's that we need something that is different so difc was missing a a different experience that's that's what we thought um spanish cuisine was underrepresented at that time um that mediterranean that modern tapas restaurant from barcelona that feel was definitely missing um casualness yet so refined casualness was definitely something missing Mm. so yes people liked 
to go to the obviously to the known names and the restaurants and obviously they're all my neighbors and they're all my friends yeah and they do what they do they do, do an excellent job but people want a slightly different experience and that's what it all started with it started with this idea of a casual space um, modern tapas restaurants from Barcelona were the inspiration okay um, but then offering really good quality food and beverage and service without the fluff of fine dining, mm. without tablecloth on the table. Yeah. A slightly more relaxed uh, vibe from your staff, slightly friendlier, slightly chattier. So that, those were the bases. Uh, okay. the, I did not come and say, oh, this is the cuisine that we're going we're gonna to do, and this is the menu, and this is the name. I didn't come up with any of this. Mm. All I came up with was the ethos to the brand, okay. uh, the ethos of the brand, the direction behind the brand, and then started picking and selecting people to work with based on their understanding of this small brief. Okay. How did they perceive that ethos that you're talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah. So met with a few, it started off with building the name, building the brand, building the, the personality. Sure. So I had to have something. So that's, that's where it all started. And I, I always wanted to work with uh, more local, uh, not necessarily some of the high-end branding agencies, but someone that was really creative, have done something kind of similar. So found these fabulous guys. They're still, they're still in market called North 55. Okay. And they really got it. They picked up on the things that we wanted to build. And uh, we came up with a name together. We came up with the name Boca. Uh, Boca means mouth in Spanish. It also means mouth in Italian with a different spelling. Um, that was the idea. The idea was to represent the uh, represent for instance that Mediterranean coastline of mm. uh, Spain, France, and and extending into the Italian Riviera. Rivier, that that was the idea. Yeah. Um, obviously, in French language, that wouldn't mend, but yeah. <laughs> and we wanted a, obviously a short name, something that would people would pick up yeah, on. It's catchy. The O is also a play on the word, so the O also represents the mouth that, ah, and the O okay. also represents the olive and the olive oil that is important in Mediterranean cuisine and also hence the green color of Boca. So there are you know, all these small stories, but it all grew organically from that part. Yeah. We then pitched this to these amazing guys, Bishop Design. And it was at the time when Bishop Design was also starting to make some noise, so I could afford them at, at that time. Um, so we, we asked them to develop the interiors for us, okay. given this branding so it it kind of grew up from that they yeah. also uh took a lot of elements from the brand and integrated into into the entire restaurant that's how we built the little skeleton mm. and then i spent time in uh between barcelona nice and a few towns in italy to try to find the right people that would help me build this okay again with the same ethos ex explaining to them what we're trying to do what we're trying to achieve, the kind of experience that we wanted people to have, and then let them bring in their expertise and their knowledge and feed into it and own it. So this way, when I found my, my partner and my operations manager, Ricardo, in Barcelona, he brought in that element. Mm. When we found the chef who was, who was already here in, in the city, he brought in his element. Sure. Uh, when we brought in the the bar manager and the service uh, um, guys, they all brought in something to the table. Yeah. So what we ended up with is this project that grew from the ground up. Yeah. And it was um, the sum of the contribution of all of these guys. So what we had is something really unique. Yeah. That is very different. You know, you can anyone can come in. There are no more, there are no secret recipes, right? There is no one formula that you can take and apply. Anyone can do it. Yeah. Right? Everything is available. All knowledge is available out there. Experience is there. But I think what was unique about Boca and what helped us with our, with our longevity right now is, is, th is that fact, is that we brought in something totally different to the IFC, yeah. something that wasn't meant to be short-lived. We weren't targeting, uh, we weren't here to make a quick buck. Mm if you can make one in, in, in F and B, uh, <laughs> it's, it's terrible. But, uh, we were here with people. We were target. We were, we were building this for people living and working in, not just in, not, not in the UAE, but in DIFC, 
and Sheikh Zayed and maybe downtown. Mm. That was our target. Yeah. We yeah. wanted to target the people working in this in, in the financial zone. Those are our customers. Yeah. And today, first of all, 50% of my customers come to Baca three times a week. That's amazing. That's such a good return um, rate. Our tourists make up maybe not more than 15% mm. of, uh, of, of, our, of our guests. So we really built it with people in mind. Yeah. And it sounds like from what you've said, the importance of putting together the right team is probably one of the biggest reasons that it's been able to be successful this long and to last this long. And I love that you went to all the different countries and brought in people with such different experience and from those countries that fit into what the brand of this is, because I think that's so important and that's what makes it so authentic. You know what I mean? Like you said, it's not the recipes. You can find good food, you can find good recipes, but when it comes down to the experience and the authenticity, that comes, that's only people that you're going to yeah. find that with. And one thing that you said um, when I was looking at the, um, the, like the core values about being professional and consistent, it's like, and what you said, what I love what you guys said is like, we're not here to give you the best once in a lifetime experience, but we're here so that every time you come here, you're going to have a good experience. And I think that I've been here myself and I've, I've, I've had a great experience. So I think you guys have achieved that amazingly. Fabulous. So congratulations on that. No, thanks. And coming back to the, I love how you described it as refined casualness, because that's what it is. That's the feel that you get when you come in here and it's more relaxed. Cause around here, like you said, it's all more fine dining. It's a bit more bougie. Mm -hmm. So like, it's really nice to have a place that you can just kick back and like, you know, have a beer or like enjoy whatever. Yeah. Um, after working, so you've been in the industry for quite a while now. And you probably see restaurants popping up left and right, but not all of them last. So my question to you is, what is the biggest challenge, I guess, or what's the biggest misconception people have when it comes to opening a restaurant? Because a lot of the times it's typically, and at least in my experience, correct me if I'm wrong, the ones you hear about are the big fine dining places and so on. And those require such a heavy investment for a market that is so difficult to like crack. So are people looking at it in the right way or is, do you have a different take on it? What would you say? It's really every time that we hear of a, of a grand opening of a massive restaurant, we we see we see the, we see the same formula being applied. First of all, the city is obsessed with imports with brands, yeah. and for a while that made sense, right? We needed these guys to come and set up shop so that we, we could you know we could first of all have some sort of legitimacy in terms of you know. In, in terms of building Dubai as a dining destination. So that makes absolute sense, of course, on, on a certain level that has to, that had to be there and, and obviously still has to be, still, still should exist for, for some time. But again, going back, so that's one element. One element is that, and this is part of why, what also makes perhaps Boca unique is the fact that we believe that we have enough creative people living and working in this city that we can come up with a brand that could rival any import from any major city in the world. Yeah. That's what we wanted to build. We wanted to build a restaurant that is on the same level, on the same class, obviously a different experience, yeah. but that's something that we wanted to do. So the fact that people are, are growing restaurants from the, from the top to, to down, yeah. that's obviously... You know, having that one formula, that one template that will apply it is obviously very dangerous. But a lot of obviously big operators are aware of that. So they always try to, you know, customize it to the local tastes and the local, you know, needs. So that, that exists. But one of the biggest perhaps challenges and perhaps what, how not a lot of people are approaching this is, is in terms of expectations. Okay. Especially here in the IFC. All restaurants that open up here they have their mindset on the big guys saying, look at Zuma, mm. look at La Petite Maison. Mm. They're making so much money. Of course, it makes sense. In theory, you would look at the car park of the IFC and there's a country with the GDP that's worth the, <laughs> the value of these cars, right? <laughs> exactly. It makes sense. It you does. Say, obviously, you've got the bankers here, the financial directors, you've got uh, the lawyers, the entertainment budgets that they have. Mm. So... That's what, if you do your research, if you look at it anecdotally, and if you look at it, it makes sense, yeah. right? It makes sense. Um, if you come here in the evening, you will see all of these restaurants full. Um, you will see the zone um, busy with very affluent people. Mm. So you say, I've got to have my restaurant here, and mm. I've got to offer the best Italian cuisine or the best Japanese cuisine or whatever it is, and offer fine dining, 
because I know fine dining. That's what also that's one of the biggest um, uh, things in F&B is that most restaurateurs open because they think they know uh, fine dining and on how to dine. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily translate into a successful business or, or a business that will stay longer. Yeah. So then then comes the expectation part, which I'm talking about. Um, saying we're going to open we're going to be busy of course we're going to be busy we're going to hire you know the pr company that's going to you know fill in uh, the do- the uh, the seats we're going to get influencers and we're going to start rolling what a lot of restaurants forget is that that's really that the first 6 months a, to a one i would say one year needs to be part of the investment so when you have the wrong expectations you open a restaurant you've invested so far 20 million dirhams, yeah. 30 million dirhams. Yeah. And, I, and I'm talking about numbers of restaurants that I've seen here in front of me yeah. over and over yeah. in fantastic locations, shut door yeah. because, because of this. They would think the, you open up, you spend so much money on interiors, you spend mo- so much money on branding and bringing in the top people, expecting that the moment you open your doors, you're going to start making, you're gonna start making yeah. the money. But no, because that's when... Obviously, you've you've organized your opening party. You started inviting all of these influencers and invited people to come in and try. Um, the bills will start start coming. The salaries need to be paid on time, mm-hmm. right? You've already employed probably staff maybe three months, sometimes six months um, ahead of the opening. So that starts. And what a lot of people, what mis- a lot of people have made uh, uh, mistakes. Um, in when when they're hit with that fact, and they realize that oh, the whatever we're making is not catching up with whatever we're spending. We're still our food cost is still high, yeah. beverage cost is still high because we're still you know chefs are, are finding their place, they're finding the right suppliers, they're adjusting recipes. So you still have six months to a year um, where you need to keep yourself afloat. Suppliers will start cutting you. Right? Yeah. They will start only accepting uh, cash on delivery. And then you'll start prioritizing perhaps that um, instead of paying salaries. Stat- staff are all, 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 all of a sudden unhappy. Mm. They haven't been paid for a month, for a month and a half, two months. Mm. And the whole thing starts crumbling. Yeah, because it's, co- it's like a puzzle that's all connected. Yes. You know, and we've seen it yeah. over and over with big investments, yeah. with big people. I can imagine. It's crazy. Yeah. This market is. Um, is heavy uh, on 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 cash. It's a it's a cash business. True. A lot yeah. of people think, a lot of people enter this industry thinking, oh, how much does it cost to brew a cup of coffee? What, one dirham, two dirhams, and you sell it at twenty, you're making so much money. The moment you pay for your cost is the moment you start paying for all the other bills. Yeah. Right. Your rent, your utilities all your contracts to maintain all the equipment that you have from ducting to AC to kitchen equipment, your salaries, all of the things that come with salaries as well, all maintaining the staff, maintaining. It's a huge P&L sheet. It's a lot of things, a lot of working elements. Yeah. A lot of people mistake restaurants with retail. What do you mean That's the mentality. They walk in saying, I bring in a product at... One dirham, I sell it at 20. That's retail. So that binary. The restaurant mm. is a factory. You bring in a product, and there's a whole process of trans- transferring that product, transferring that raw material into the final product. And there are so many working elements and moving parts that you need to, on a daily basis, maintain. I wish it was, it was, it was retail. So that's the other part where people okay. kind of do not see it. It's a, it's a very dark industry. Unless you're in it, unless you're from inside, there are so many small little things that you will not be aware of unless you are in it, you're here on a daily basis, and you have some sort of background or some sort of experience in it. And I, I've learned it the hard way, and I'm still learning until today. Yeah. I'm still uncomfortable with certain concepts that are so unique to this industry. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I can. Im- <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, coming back to the thing you said about, I love what you said about how when people, you know, you've seen them make these huge investments, but there's they have because of I guess the glamour that surrounds us and mm-hmm. where you think it distorts 
the reality and your expectations of what actually it takes to make this something like this successful. Coming, but you said, remember we said like it takes six, maybe they need six months, three months. They like hired people before they even start. Do you think one of the mistakes people make is they're not taking enough time to really understand what something like this will entail? And they're just this vision and all be great and whatever. And everyone just kind of like the investors and the probably founders along just go along with it without really taking the time to really understand what are the all these little moving parts that you talked about that are going to need this to work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, in terms of time and in terms of having the right people on board mm. to understand all these small things. I'll give you like a quick example. Sure. And it's something that we fell into. So the time that it took us to build Boca was definitely almost double the time that we were that we were supposed to. We were delayed. We were we were supposed to open within nine months. It took us 18 months oh, wow. to open. Wow, yeah. okay. And it was because of things like that, because we thought that we had all the elements on board we had the right brand we had the right approvals initial approvals um from the authorities from the landlord we had people starting to come on board and we thought i thought with my project management skills that i'm able to keep track in all of them but obviously the things that set us back are the things that we had no idea that they, they were they were even up for discussion mm. simple things in restaurant bef- when you're building a restaurant before you even start talking about the brand or the cuisine or, or what you're going to serve or what the experience is like, you have to have the basics in place, your, your mechanical and electrical and plumbing works in place. What I mean by that mm-hmm. is that when we were given this space, even after we inherited from the previous restaurant, the space was initially built to be an art gallery. Okay. What does that mean? That means that, yes, maybe the space will look great and um, you can do something with it. But what, is it, what it means in terms of electricity, that means that if I plugged in one coffee machine, I would have consumed all the electricity that was set for this space. Yeah. AC power was not enough to cool the entire space. It was not enough to cope with just the amount of equipment that were meant to come in to produce the food that we wanted to produce. So before you build any restaurant, these and these are all calculations and numbers and figures. It's, um, it, it's a clear science. Yeah. And you have people who, who do this for you. If you have the right consultants on the job, if you have the right contractor on the job, they will come in and say, okay, what did, give me the list of equipment that you need. And it's something that goes back and forth. It's like kind of... Um, kind of the chicken and the egg. Mm. So, for example, I was asked by the uh, consultants to give me the list of equipment that we wanted to have in the restaurant and the the maximum capacity of of people that we had in the restaurant, whether they're going to be smoking or not, way before we put a single nail. So we had to go... So you had to have this um, high-level vision Mm. of what the restaurant in full operation will look like yeah. um, so that they can make the calculation, the right calculation. Because if you don't have the right electricity, you don't have the right cooling power, you don't have the right um, pressure in terms of air, air exhaust and the suction, then either your electricity is going to keep tripping and machines are going to go bust. People are going to be sitting in the middle of summer sweating in their seats, uncomfortable. Yeah. Or you're going to smell smoke in the entire restaurant, no matter what. Um, or you're going to have smoke in, 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 in the service room yeah. because your kitchen exhaust could, could not cope. So imagine us walking into Gate Village 6 here in the IFC when in the building there's one fan on the roof, there's one cable of power going into the building, and there's one pipe that's feeding chilled water. And those three are shared with... Just the biggest restaurant in the city, right, <laughs> Zuma? So they've got their thing rolling. And that's, again, if, you know, if, you, if we branch there into that discussion, yeah. a lot of people ask, why is Zuma so, su- so successful? Why are these restaurants so successful? You've got the operator who walked in when they were laying the foundations of Gate Village 6 to say, I want my valet to pick up people. I want my, my uh, elevator to pick up people from the street. That is for the restaurant. I want to throw uh, air from my kitchen. They have, they have two robotic grills. They have two grills. You know amount of suction power that you need? They need that fan to be at X amount of power. Mm. And I need to consume at least 90% of it. 
I need to be able to throw air on this level in the basement. I need this, 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 this. So before they even were talking about service or restaurant, they were laying the right foundations for a successful restaurant. And that's what a lot of people don't see. A lot of people say, give me any space in DIFC, please. There's a queue. There's a queue at DIFC asking for locations because people think that the moment you set up a restaurant, any brand, on a fine dining level, then you're gonna make it. Yeah. And we've seen how that is not true. How that, yeah, that doesn't yeah. play out. So that's really important. Before you know, anyone starts talking about um, uh, the the type of cuisine or the brand or who, who sh which chef to to put in that space, that location is not just about the locate the address. Yeah. But it's about what the space offers you. Exactly. In terms of all of these things to help you operate the proper restaurant. Yeah. Right cooling. The right, you know, the right amount of exhaust for whatever you're going to be cooking in the kitchen, and to keep the air fresh inside the restaurant. Obviously, the right electricity and the right connections, the right plumbing. Yeah. So it's kind of like, uh, first of all, I never knew that. I never considered it from that way because I thought, and I love that you use the Zuma example because I agree that is probably one of the most successful restaurants, if not the most okay. successful in the city. And I always thought, like, because I've been many times, oh, it's just great food, great service, blah blah blah. But I never considered all the things that go behind it and the fact that the guy actually went when it was being when the foundation was being laid so you could be that technical and that targeted with what you need so it's kind of like it's almost like you're building a building like a 100%. restaurant almost like you're the same analogy you know you have to put in the foundation before you pick out like what type of glass how tall is it going to be all that kind of stuff you need whatever the space is to understand what we need to do how do we need to build this before we can move on that's really really interesting i never considered that no, before no. yeah and when it comes to opening a restaurant what I've noticed is as well, people typically like to go for size, mm. you know, like big, large, see a large number of people. In my mind, I've always thought, what if you just flipped it, a smaller space, less people, but like you can really focus and concentrate and grow it from there. So do the same principles apply whether it's a big restaurant or a small restaurant? And why do you think a lot of people typically just go for big? That's been traditionally um, for, for a long time. The world has abandoned that. But I think here in the city, we still, we're still seeing a lot of that. Yeah, Even exactly. until recently. Yeah. I really don't know what it is. What is the obsession? Um, whether it's something from when the numbers are being crunched, perhaps, at the beginning, when, when funds are being raised. The, the more seats you have in a restaurant, that means the more covers that you can put in. Mm. But does that really translate into what is going on in the market and what people are looking at? That's definitely not true. I still believe that Boca is, is a, of a large size. Perhaps we're lucky that we have the restaurant spread out into different corners. So yeah, we have you yeah. you know, the main terrace that fits up to perhaps, you know, well, not, the moment, not, not anymore with the whole distance thing. So we used to be able to fit 50 people. We're at 35 right now, 30, 35 max. Mm -hmm. We've got another smaller terrace that's an area that's usually uh, preferred by corporates to, big, to book uh, separately like for their own event, yeah. right? So that fits another 20, 25 people. And then you've got uh, the, main, uh, the main island bar, which is really tiny. Um, if you have 10 people around the bar, the bar will be busy. You've got uh, you know, the area that's around our gastro bar, our cold kitchen. Um, again, so we've got these nooks and we've got the cellar downstairs. So it kind of, it feels intimate wherever you're sitting. Yeah. But I still believe it's big. I think it's now's the time for small, small restaurants, um, 40 seats to open. A big focus on the experience, on a quality of that service. Doesn't doesn't have to be fine dining. Doesn't have to be super experimental. It could still be casual, but it could be done with a lot more heart and a lot more soul. Mm. Um, that is at least from from my perspective and my guys share my view is that definitely moving forward, smaller, more intimate restaurants is definitely what is needed for yeah. sure. That yeah, obsession yeah. with large scale, huge, um, big fine dining restaurants. And we're still seeing, we're still seeing them open up is yeah. definitely not the way. Yeah. There's something that is perhaps large scale, but it's still a different experience. Food halls is, is, oh, is yeah. a big trend right now. Yeah. Yeah. But that's exciting because that's sort of a, you know, you offering, obviously, on a very casual uh, level, experiences from multiple smaller, you know, uh, 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 restaurants or food providers that will give you, you know, smaller experience. So that's obviously, those are large scale, they're opening, but they're, 
um, they're they're differently. So we're seeing a, a few of them being announced right now. There's, really, there's Dipa Chica in on on the pond that's already open. Uh, there's the one from uh, Bull and Roo that's going to open now in the in, in the ICB Brookfield's building here next door. Um, there's the timeout market that mm. was announced recently to be open next year. So yeah, you know, those are exciting. That, that's true. I, that's actually a very interesting point because I remember there's a place in Amsterdam called Food Holland, and it's literally exactly what you're talking about. And it's beautiful, like it's very very clean. It's beautifully done, mm -hmm. and you can, I can get Spanish here and walk to the other side and exactly. get like sushi like exactly. with it. So exactly. it's yeah. and it, it's a very chilled experience, and it's very fun, and mm. you have so many options. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting that now it's making that transition yeah, here. I think it would work here. Oh, absolutely. I think absolutely. it would work. For People sure. like variety sure. at the For end sure. of the day. For yeah, sure. yeah. For sure. Coming on to the whole because i know you guys in 2019 got the uh award for sustainability and i know sustainability is a big uh you know a very important thing for you and for for boca as well and i actually was reading the article that you wrote that sustainability and financial viability go hand in mm -hmm. hand so why is it so important and why is it such a big passion of yours because i know you guys employed a waste officer to manage all this kind of stuff so why is it such so important for you to reduce waste is it just purely financial or is there a bigger motive behind it as well so uh, this all started again with the foundations. When we were building the foundations of Boca, we, because we wanted to build a homegrown brand, we wanted to also make use of local produce at that time. Mind you, this was 2014. Yeah? Okay. So we were, not a lot of people were talking about this, but we thought, at least locally, but what is very common all over the world is that you, the, the, the people that you see first in, in the fish market or the vegetable market in any part of the world, the first guys that you see, uh, the first guys and girls in, 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 that you see at 6 o'clock in the morning are chefs of restaurants going in to pick in their produce. They have the right guys. So we thought, listen, we, yes, we live in the desert, but we've got over 1,000 kilometers of coastline. So there's abundance of fish and seafood. Um, so we thought we want to, we want to dedicate, and this is and this is what I mean by putting this in the foundation. So we set up already a system with our accounts team and my chefs to hand them cash on a daily basis and go to the market, and return with whatever is in season, whatever is sustainable. So for example, we never had hamur on our menus because hamur for a long time was on the endangered species list. Okay. Right? It's in high demand. Every big buffet in town when we had buffets, every big hotel wanted to have hamur in the menu. Um, people who would generally come into the country, they the first thing they would hear of hamur and there is obviously there's also this um, uh, misconception that baby hamours are tastier. So you okay. can imagine what that does with, to the population. So mm. that's one of the things. So, But that's how we set it up. And we set it up in the way that we also receive, you know, when the guys come back from the market, they will hand over a, a scribbled note from from their guy. And that is perhaps the challenge over here because a lot of the a lot of restaurants, a lot of operators, are uh, their accounting teams are set up in a way, they're set up by people who are not from the FME industry. Okay. So your accountant will typically ask you for uh, registration of the supplier, having credit notes, not paying cash, but paying in checks. So to to explain that to our, it took it took a challenge, but this was part of the concept. Okay, and it grew from there. So yeah. from that point onwards, we were simp we were getting in. Um, I think just one or two types of fish, uh, maybe prawns. That was an easy one initially. And then we expanded that. And I think we were also lucky that we uh, rode the wave here in the UAE where a lot, of far, a lot of attention from the government was being geared towards uh, expanding sustainable fishing. Um, we now have huge uh, f um, farm fishing uh, facilities, obviously fish farm, huge one by, by the government. Um, a lot of money is being pumped into uh, new hydroponics, new organic farming, new tra traditional farming. So we were, we, you know, we kept in touch with the market and wanted to know all these people who were coming up with all of these amazing produce mm. so our uh, list expanded from just a couple to almost 90 percent of our fish and seafood in season is sourced locally 
That's amazing. That's yeah. awesome. And um, and that's what we also we always thought. We thought we have abundance of that produce. Yes, maybe um, the sea bass that is coming in from the Gulf is not comparative in quality uh, to the sea bass coming out of the Mediterranean. Sure. But with if it's super fresh, it, with certain techniques and um, just a few adjustments here and there, you could come up with a really good product. Yeah. And you don't and you don't have to mm -hmm. charge an arm and a leg for it, right? Because that is also another advantage that you're buying stuff straight from the guy. Uh, obviously, there are big challenges still in the in in, in fisheries yeah. over here. So we found out later on that, for example, one of the big problems. And this is something that maybe no one's talking about right now is that the guy who's selling us the fish, that fish from that morning, from, from four o'clock in the morning, has already exchanged five hands already. Between to get to him, yeah, really? Between middlemen and handlers. Wow. That's a different story. But when we get it straight from this guy into into our restaurant, we've already cut a lot of you know, a lot of logistics. Of course, right? Yeah. We, we do it ourselves. Yep. So that was one part. And then it moved into vegetables and seafood. Obviously that's still quite low mm. but um, we're getting to know a lot of a lot of amazing people that are doing great work here and we love to tell these stories so just to close on the fish and seafood sure. obviously one of the one of the greatest stories and um, one of the people that we admire and respect a lot is Rami Murray who started okay. Diba Bay Oysters okay we think that this guy is a genius I mean for him to first come up with this idea and explain it to the authorities what he wants to do to 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 grow oysters here in on, on the East Coast, he faced a lot of challenges and he had to move from one emirate to the other until he found the right spot and he was producing these fabulous, beautiful oysters that are on par with anything that we're getting from France and from Japan. It has the right, you know, uh, meatiness and, 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 and salinity and sweetness. It's beautiful. Mm. And it's coming from here, from Fujairah. It's amazing. Now that's all we stock. We don't stock any other oysters. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, and we love it. Yeah. And obviously thinking about it, it makes absolute sense. This was, this was a country that was built on uh, pearl diving. Yeah. So it makes true. absolute sense. Yeah. I used to think that you know, oysters would only grow in, uh, in colder waters, but actually not, not at all. They thrive in warm waters. Actually, they grow faster. Rami oh, has really? a problem with keeping <laughs> up with the size. So that's another great story. Um, on, on the vegetable and, and the produce side, obviously we're seeing great stuff done by the likes of Yazan Kadamani from Emirates Biofarm. We've got the guys from IGR in Abu Dhabi. Um, we love this story. There's, uh, there's someone called Marianne. She runs a place called Marianne's Fresh Produce. Um, it's a Dutch lady that, um, that hired this, um, she, she had this, I think it's an abandoned villa somewhere between Dubai and Al Ain. So you're on the road, you have to take a hard turn into a few farms and then drive a little bit off road to reach this abandoned villa. So it's a one woman show. And okay. in that villa, she grows edible flowers. Really? Yeah. Oh, Small wow. truck, it's just her. She comes in twice a week to Dubai, delivers to myself, I think my neighbor, Zuma, and that's all she does, edible flowers, locally grown. That's so awesome. Tons of stories of people like this. Yeah. It's great, we love it. Yeah. Um, we follow closely what um, Her Excellency Maryam Al Maheri uh, does and the Ministry of Food Security. Uh, we love what she says. What she says. She, she, what she says that we have abundance of three things: sun, sand, and water. True. And there's surely something that we can do around that. Yeah. Uh, they're funding right now. Again, one of our close friends and people that we that we come to know. Uh, people from uh, something called ICBA or ICBA, okay. uh, the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, mm -hmm. run by Dr. Ismahan. What the center is meant to do is that it's, it's scientists. There's a bunch of scientists in there. And what they're trying to do is uh, cross-cultivate crops to uh, have them grow in high salinity water okay. and in very harsh weather and soil conditions. So they boiled it down to four a type of quinoa, a type of um, um, red mill a millet, a pearl millet, and salicornia, and another one I can't remember. So these are all crops with very high nutri nu nutrients, mm -hmm. very high pro uh, uh, vegetable proteins yeah. um, that can provide a solution to you know to 
to, to the world. So we're trying to, um, we've, we've done a couple of visits. Obviously, we love the work there. We follow them closely. And we try to talk about them in our food as well. So we've created a couple of experiences where we have salicornia, for example. We put it in our food so that we c it becomes a, a, talking a, a point. top, exactly, a talking yeah. point yeah. to tell these stories sure. and, and what we're aligned with. And that has translated into, obviously, us taking a look at waste. And I think it was a realization four years ago of how much us as a restaurant, just a realization of us as a restaurant, how much, first of all, how much we drive consumption. We're asking people to come and consume. And how much waste pr we produce. Mm. The moment we, we looked at the numbers, just... Just looking at the, you know, not just from an overall level. From that moment, we never looked back. We thought this is something we have to really address, address mm. and talk about. And it started with us understanding exactly what we produce in terms of waste. Okay. So we set up a very simple program, a separation program of everything that we produce. So what do we produce in terms of waste? Obviously, there's organic waste. That is um, after we produce our recipes. Um, plus what is left from guests. There is obviously plastic, there is glass, there is uh, cooking oil, there is um, cardboard and paper. So um, what we said, okay, let's look at them. Plastic is something huge. What do we produce in terms of plastic? We've never had plastic bottles uh, here. We never used them. We never used them. Um, but we have, for example, things from the bar, like single-use Straws, Straw, stairs, yep. uh, cling film in the kitchen. So obviously we eliminated everything that we could. Cling film is still a tricky part because it's obviously um, something required from, to preserve, uh, from hygiene. You know. yeah, right? So there are solutions. We're looking at them. Um, we considered obviously bottling our own water because glass, what we discovered later on, was our biggest waste in terms of weight. Really? Yeah, glass. Wow, okay. So we produce so much glass. But us realizing that had us start a conversation with our partners. We've never changed water suppliers, the guys from Aquapana San Pellegrino, obviously the local um, a supplier here, uh, Bitfood. So we, ha we started having conversations saying, guys, can we talk about you picking up the glass bottles one, the moment they're empty? Why don't we pick them up? It's something that you know people have done in the past successfully. Imagine if they do that. That will slash my glass waste by almost half. And mind you, I have no one to report on these numbers. We just track them internally. Yes, for so yourselves, yeah. We set up the separation program. Mm -hmm. We assigned one of our senior members to be that waste officer okay. to make sure that the guys are obviously separating correctly because, you know, you tend to, you know, fall into it. You're super busy. You have to take care of guests before you even, you know, start looking at the waste. So separating correctly um, before it leaves the restaurant, that is weighed on a big scale, and then that's registered. Make sure that they register it accurately. Mm -hmm. um, and then, obviously, when they go downstairs to the basement to separate it, which is a big challenge, because apparent downstairs, the, the categories are not that huge in terms of separation. Okay, I've got a cage for, which is very typical in the city, a cage for cardboard and paper. I've got a tank for oil, and we collect oil. Um, but then everything else is just put together. So yeah. although we separate them, they all end up in the same. Yeah. We've seen and we've spoken already to the guys from BIA, from Sharjah, okay. which we understand now are coming into DIFC to take care of the waste management. Okay. We've seen some extra separation um, uh, uh, containers downstairs, but there's still, I don't think anyone's keeping track. I've been taking a look at these. No one's separating correctly. Mm. Uh, they're being used by everyone in, in the building to mm. put together everything. Yeah. So, th so, so from the moment that we realized the waste that we produce, we started setting up these programs. Okay. And the challenge is, I tell you, the biggest challenge, you can come up with all sorts of ideas on how to you know, reuse or separate, but if it's not integrated into the SOP, into the service operation procedure for every single guy here, again, going back to the fact that the restaurant is like a factory, not a retail outlet, no. it's not going to be done. The guys are busy. Mind you, I have a restaurant to run. We have guests to yeah, serve, right? We have a lot of other problems to deal with on many levels yeah. before we even talk talking about waste. But it had to be integrated. Mm. And I must, again, um, obviously boils down to having a fabulous team and guys who are yeah. able to 
uh, understand. And obviously, it didn't happen overnight. This is something that took a lot of talk, a lot of conversation, a lot of presentation. Evolution. It was an absolute evolution. We never yeah. got to where we are right now. From And there's still a lot of work to be done. Sure. So just in um, encouraging that culture of reusing. So obviously, any professional uh, kitchen, any professional chef already knows how to maximize usage of the produce. They know what to do with the peels. They know what to do with the the rest of the, the carcass of the fish or the animal before it's thrown away. But now they're given an extra incentive, and obviously to incentivize them is very important, to, to, to get creative in terms of what they can do and perhaps push that forward to the guest to see. Because a lot of it is in the background. Of course, yeah. Right? Yeah. The stocks and the broth, that's done in the background. No one really talks about the fact that it's done but made by the bones of, of that, of the, right? Yeah, no yeah, no one talks about it because it's a given. But certain ways, certain techniques, so, you know, having a new perspective, fresh view of things can maybe have that, give the people that talking point and we can showcase what we really care about and what we spend yeah. our time doing. Yeah. For example, recently, last year, we introduced this dish. We wanted to bring in to showcase more local vegetables. Okay. Um, no matter how humble, we, we started talking about the, the beetroot. And it's something that is a passion of uh, our chef, Chef Matthias. He's Dutch and he's, he's, he loves the beetroot. So we took the hum like a local beetroot and we aged it just like you would age a fine steak. Okay, interesting. We let it uh, sit in a, in a uh, temperature and, and a humidity controlled um, uh, fridge and let it uh, uh, age and, and lose water content. So you have the flavors intensifying and then use that in the dish. So that becomes the main ingredient mm, rather yeah. than being the side ingredient. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So and that's what we try to do with all of, of all of our dishes, all, all of our food is to have, you know, to think about it, to really think about it, to try to use what we have. Chef is also very aware. And again, a lot of chefs will do that um, to make sure that your ingredients are used in multiple areas in your in your menu mm. in a fresh and new way, rather yeah. than just putting it as, as another ingredient. Um, the guys behind the bar are incentivized to do that as well. So now we have a lot of our syrups made with, we, we, fresh we, we squeeze juice ev every day. Every day, orange, lemon, cucumber, pineapple are squeezed fresh every morning. Yeah. They save the husks, they save the peels, they save the pulp, and they make syrups out of it. Okay. So you, yeah. you put it in a massive container, you throw sugar in it, cover it, leave it for, for a day, and then you squeeze out that syrup, you strain it, it becomes syrup that they will use in cocktails right? afterwards. Um, the pulp, so they would save up pulp of a pineapple, for example. They save up pulp of the pineapple, and then they will dehydrate it, and it becomes a candy that we use for garnish for, for the drink. Whatever garnish or peels that they use for cocktails in terms of slices of orange or lemon or, or uh, orange peels or pineapple, they will save all of that if it doesn't go into operation for the day, dehydrate it, put it in a bag, and put it back into teas the yeah, next day. Exactly. So the, the bar is incentivized. Whatever cocktail they, they will create, whatever procedure they will make, they're incentivized to do it with whatever weight and become creative about it. Mm. We have this... A cocktail, the first cocktail that we created, we call it a no waste cocktail. It's basically um, um, it's cucumber and passion fruit. So they squeeze the entire, they blend the entire cucumber. No, don't, they don't peel it, they don't chop the ends. And then strain it and save the pulp. Um, passion fruit, they scoop out the passion fruit and then save the shell. Uh, and then obviously they blend it with. Um, uh, they blend it and then that becomes obviously the cocktail with the pulp of the cucumber. They dehydrate it, that becomes the garnish. And then the uh, shell of the passion fruit, we uh, crush it and then we put it together into a, uh, we glue it together, it becomes the coaster. Mm. 
for the drink. Okay. So there you go. Nothing goes into the garbage. And obviously, so on and so forth. Everything is, you know, sure. the guys encourage to use all of these elements into their operation. Yeah. We encourage also, um, you know, we look at what we produce. So a lot of corks are lying around. So all of our, um, all of our mats for the paellas are made up of, of, the, cor- of the corks, the corks. Yeah. right? So we try as much, you know, all the boxes that we receive, the crates, we use them for decoration. We give them away as gifts to our guests. They use them as pot, you know, sort of for their soil, for pots, for, you know, as, as shelves. So we try as much as possible to look at everything that w- comes into the restaurant. Supplier comes in the restaurant with uh, plastic bags. So we cause the guys, please, we empty it, take it back. Or give it to us in these large crates that we can empty it and take it back. So it's continuously looking at the entire value chain, yeah. how you, we receive the produce until the moment that it ends at the guest's, guest's plate. Yeah. What can we do in the process? What comes out? What is waste? What can we do without? How can yeah. we reduce it? Yeah. That is just the constant now obsession of everyone in the restaurant. Yeah. And like you said, it's not just about maximizing what you can do with the product. In order to be doing the kind of things that you guys are doing now, all these different things in the restaurant to maximize you know, and to reduce the waste, there has to be, like you said, an incentive and a process in place for you to do that. You know, it has to be very clear, like, you know, but also fuels your creativity. Whoever's involved, you know, maybe you could use this for that or that, Absolutely. so on. So Absolutely. it also empowers, I think, the employees to like oh, start thinking sure. more connected sure. as well. Yeah. Now the guys have full ownership yeah. and they're proud when they come up with stuff like that. They're super proud of it, for yeah. sure, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, whenever, whenever we have opportunities to do events, and we do a lot of those, you know, with friends that we meet along the way, either suppliers of, of amazing products that we work with or uh, simply people who we share the same ideas mm. and the same thoughts. So we always make sure that there is that element that is... Sh- so let's say we're doing a month celebrating everything that is coming from Rioja in Spain. So there's a certain cuisine. We make sure that we're using as much local ingredients, first and foremost. If we can replace it, then we can do it. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll do it so to showcase that. Although the theme probably has nothing to do with that, but we make sure that we're highlighting Think, yeah, whatever, exactly. whatever local. Um, yeah. yeah, and so I love what you said about the sustainability, about it being homegrown and using local suppliers, going to you know, those kind of fish markets and so on, and really you know, utilizing what you have instead of needing to you know, import from outside and really like giving back to kind of what is helping the restaurant be successful, the community that is helping you be successful. One thing that I was thinking about, and uh, I have a friend of mine who's in FMB, but in a different way, so we talk about this often. On the concept of suppliers, could you give me and like us a little bit of insight into, like for example, like you have your relationships with your suppliers. Do those suppliers also supply other people or is it important to find, you know, have exclusivity or what that, how do we come up with that? What's the secret to that supplier puzzle? I think it's, it's, again, it's, it's a people's business. Okay. And relationships are extremely important. Okay. Um, b- before we start talking about the product, I think what we really enjoy is finding people that share the same ethos with us, that, that care as much as we do about the things that we talk about, mm. about um, having this sustainable business model that is not just here to, you know, to sort of make it for a year or two and then shut down and you know, do something else. Um, that is something that we obviously only became comfortable with after the first two years. So the first two years of our operation was all about fine tuning. Mm. We fell into many problems after opening, right? You know, we already had delays in terms of opening and then we opened. And then we were faced with this again, this expectation when we thought the business was gonna go on a certain level. That was the time when obviously the industry was getting saturated, people were being very cautious. Um, There were a lot of openings. Um, Perhaps people didn't really understand what we're trying to do. We were trying to find ourselves as well, right? So uh, the restaurant was finding its personality and and, and its space. So we fell into into traps and loopholes where we were suddenly faced with with debt that we couldn't manage all of a sudden. So obviously we tried to you know in the beginning it was sort of we just ignore we just keep pushing and then we realize oh this is not going anywhere and that's the moment when i realized and we all realized that we have to face this and face these people these are not just suppliers of product these are people that 
also believe in their product and their brands and, and the people that they represent. So we brought everyone to the table and started you know, talking, renegotiating some of that, and we did. We cleared everything, and from that moment onwards, we uh, consolidated the list of people that we work with yeah. to make sure that you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, if I buy sometimes, the, if we've got great beef coming in from all over the world, right? So everyone has something to offer. Yes, of course, the price will be different here and there. But what is more important is the relationship, mm. right? Yeah. It's not necessarily always getting the cheapest product across the board. Of course, you have to have the quality, yes, for sure. But quality, you know, you can get quality from different, different parts, different sites. Um, but what is way more important is to work with people that, um, that really appreciate and know what we do. And then when it comes to product, Yes, of course. We're constantly seeking things that perhaps not everyone is uh, looking at. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, not just getting exclusive products, our ability to make decisions really fast, our ability to change our menus almost on a monthly basis, I think is, is a dynamic that is way more important. Usually, typically, that's not something shared in at least in this part of the world. Again, because of these accounting systems mm -hmm. that are historic that's in, that are inherited from the hotel industry yeah where in order to list a new product if you want to change your and i've heard this this is an anecdotal story i've heard if you want to change your vanilla supply if you want to buy all of a sudden different vanilla from from a different part of the world that decision has to be signed off by a few people it can sometimes go all the way to the top in a in a typical hotel structure things are changing of course but Something that we're able to do in independent restaurant, especially if the people making the decision are here on the floor, in touch with the market, understand the value, making a quick decision is something that is really, that's way more important than getting the exclusive product. Because you can get an exclusive product, but to list it, to integrate it into your menu, by mm. the time you start talking about it, perhaps that conversation is over. Yeah. Or that seasonality of that dish is, is, is no longer there. Yeah. So, what I believe in is are two things: is is um, the relationship that you have with uh, with with your suppliers, with your people, and the ability to make decisions quite fast and bring it to market fast. fast yeah. yeah, no, I love that. I think you you hit the nail on the head about it's people working with people in this business, and it's important to develop those kind of relationships because, like you said, you can probably get good products from like a lot of people but when you have that relationship with someone typically you're gonna they're gonna also care and want to give you the best product because of the relationship that you guys have together as well yeah. so and like you said the ability to make quick decisions integrate it into the menu since your menu like you said is dynamic and it's always evolving you kind of need that otherwise there's going to be some lag time you maybe you won't be able to make the adjustments that you guys are looking to make mm -hmm. and also that makes a lot of sense i wanted to come on to the thing that everyone's been going through this year which is covid and as you know, and respected many you know, industries, but I think particularly the restaurant business, especially at the beginning, you know, and I know you were on the, the panel with, for the, what was it? Sorry, just for the Cater Middle East Conference. Mm -hmm. you, you were involved in that. So I was curious and I listened to what you said about how for the first few months, you, you know, you guys took salary cuts, but everyone else, the, all the employees got paid, but you, the, like the heads are the ones who like took, took it on them to make sure everyone gets paid and so on. And then you reduced the amount of people because you needed, you know, you can only bring like half the staff and so on, but I, I'm sure you'll explain the story in a second. But well, I wanted to understand from that conference, what was the biggest takeaway that you took from having those discussions with all those people? So, yeah, so that's initially what we did when we went into lockdown. We obviously had no idea how long we're going to be shut for, um, what would be the next steps, how we're going to reopen. So that was the I think the biggest challenge. Yeah, we didn't let anyone go. We kept anyone on our um, on our payroll. We tried, obviously, within those the period of lockdown, to pay everyone at least their um, their vacation days. Um, on, on the second month, so the first month, everyone got paid their full salaries. The second month, everyone got um, depending on their obviously level within the their salaries, they sure. got paid a certain number of days to obviously just keep everyone sort of afloat. And then when we came back, uh, obviously everyone came back on a, on a salary cut, again, based on position, based on, on salary. Certain people obviously got more, the higher you, you are. Um, and then when we came back, we obviously didn't know how things, again, didn't how things are gonna go and how, for how long. So it was all about 
paying back suppliers. It was all about keeping the lights on, and it was all about bring giving back pe- the people's uh, livelihoods. Yeah. That was what it's all about. Yeah. So we and we were very transparent with everyone. Um, we told everyone that, listen, we just came back into operation. So the first, we were gonna split everything we collect into thirds, one third to keep the lights on again, one third to pay suppliers and to pay back everything that we owe mm-hmm. from before lockdown, and obviously, pay salaries of everyone. Yeah, and we did, and we were able to do that within two months. So within two months, we restructured that small little debt that we owed. We paid everything out. Um, and we were lucky in the fact that we things bounced back quite hard, but now they've obviously come down again. Mm-hmm. And I think those first three months, and that's shared with a lot of people in the industry, is that you know people were happy just to go out again. Yes, there were a lot of restrictions, but that was offset by perhaps uh, slightly higher spending that we've seen than before. Things have gone down again now, uh, and then and I think this is going to be the new the new norm, if you like, yeah. is that we're going to be operating under very strict um, low capacities. People are still going to be scared. People are not going to be able to make you know big decisions. We rely a lot on uh, corporates here in the IFC. We've seen a lot of our regular um, uh, uh, companies, regular guests, shift offices. Obviously, everyone's working from home. Mm, yeah. Some people have been <clears throat> repatriated back to their home countries. So that's a big challenge. But I think, you know, going back to your question regarding that specific conference and what, you know, I think more than ever, even during lockdown, the industry has come together in a way that we've never seen before. Okay. And it's still very fragmented because obviously the industry is built by, you know, a, a huge number of operators from different backgrounds operating different style of restaurants different style of service but is obviously there's there's a lot more common than there isn't between all of these and and an industry came together in a really really beautiful way and if there is something that we wanted to take away or 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 leave people with is how difficult it is to operate in this industry and perhaps you know people who are who who think in um in a you know in a in a binary way or in a in a very simplistic view of the, the industry that it being like I said before similar to a retail yeah. space or mm. uh, the people who are processing saying why do you charge so much for a cup of coffee when your cost the cost to you is two dirhams or whatever it is or three dirhams so you know to, for people to understand what goes in the background. Mm. It's something that we were never good at showing because obviously we're here to serve people. You know, we're here to make sure that people, when the people approach us, people are, um, people want to escape to a different, you know, they don't want to cook at home. Yeah. First of all, they yeah. want to come out and be served. Yeah. Right. And that's what restaurants are here for. Yeah. So we need to make sure that that is obviously executed correctly. But also, we, I think we're one of the industries that was hit the hardest. Probably. Obviously, there's yeah. a lot more industries. There are other industries that are hit very, very bad, but we're definitely one of them because, as you can see, as you can see in many parts of the world, they're into another lockdown, and there is no way for small businesses to be able to sustain this. It's very difficult. It's very hard, and I, I hope that was one of the things that we left people with. Yeah. No, I think, you, and you said it, like, so right, that it's interesting how everything came together and, like, this crisis kind of, lifted the curtain on how difficult this industry is and how much goes on behind the scenes that yep. me as a guest, you know, I come in, I have good food, whatever. I'm like, okay, it's great. Yep, yep, yep. And that's, I, I leave, I don't think, I don't think more of it, but now I have, I think there's a much better understanding of how much goes into it. Yep. So moving forward, do you think, well, hopefully there's not another COVID in the future, but do you think now moving forward, restaurants have to have some type of contingency plan in place for like something like this, like, Boca like Boca is the restaurant, but we also have like a delivery arm that might need to start like coming into play into that to offset you know any potential like yeah, you know negatives sure, in the future. For sure, for sure. There's a lot of talk about obviously um, yeah expanding into things that would help you to survive. Yeah. For example, we we never had delivery. We've had delivery before, but we never really relied on it. It was just an extra additional thing. So we, we we put some work and effort into that. It still needs obviously a lot of work. That marketplace is also saturated and has 
a certain um it has a certain it's driven by different elements what we provide here is your is an experience is yeah. when people come out is what you talk to obviously the guys on the floor and you know you get you get the certain style of food it's slightly i wouldn't say ceremonial but it's more really of a like an event something yeah. you go to so yeah, yeah. to to have that delivery model that would translate that imme- like directly will not work because you know you will have maybe an order by a guest who really likes our food once a week so you're really relying on that occasional you know rare one one off mm. dinner that they want to maybe have with their with their friends or so so that doesn't work and that's why we translate that's why when we reopened we almost rebranded okay we uh thought okay we need to we're going back we don't know how people are going to perceive dining out anymore surely we cannot talk about some of the slightly more um complex ideas or elaborate dishes we need to go back with a very simple approach yeah and what better way than to go back to the original ethos of boca which were tapas simple simple straightforward spanish tapas and that's why we we reopened we branded uh, was something called La Taperia, something we, yeah, that, we, that we worked on during the lockdown. Uh, we created a totally different uh, brand, almost an alter ego. We even created a, a fictional chef and a story behind that. Um, so, and, and that was it. So it was all about the basics, the basic tapas that you will see in, in anywhere in Spain. Um, obviously, we, we reduced the prices. Uh, we started offering half portions. There was a lot of talk in the industry of people not wanting to share food anymore. Obviously, that wasn't the case, but we still had had an option because tapas works that way. Yeah, you can order exactly. half a portion and not share it and have it on, on your own. So that was something we reopened. We saw a slightly larger traction, but mm. again, it still needs obviously a lot of work. But one other thing that is really important is the level ex- of exposures and the thin... Um, uh, uh, what is the word? Your uh, reserves in terms of cash. Mm. A lot of, and this is not just common in the industry. I think this is common across all small, medium businesses in in the country. Is that the reserve levels are not there to to uh, to to sustain you for more than two months, three yeah. months, right? Yeah. So you get hit with a lockdown. That cash flow that, that will. That could take you out. Yeah. Definitely take you out. And I wonder how many more uh, restaurants are 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 gonna cl- are gonna close because situation is still difficult. Yeah. Um, things are still extremely uh, slim. I hope not. But that's that exposed a lot of that. That definitely exposed a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think what you said is very. It's great advice that moving forward, you need to have that, I guess, that insight or some kind of creative way to start, you know, pivoting and maybe different kind of revenue streams that fall under the same for, sure. for the restaurant. For sure. But just for so sure. that sure. if there's less people in, you can yeah. you know, shift yeah. to that way. But like you said, the f- delivery thing is driven by different elements. Like if I wanted to eat from Boca, I'd rather come here. I wouldn't yeah. really necessarily yeah. want to order it. Yeah. Now, just because of the quality yeah, yeah, of food sure. is just because, you know, uh, you want the experience exactly. and you want all that together. Um, I'm gonna, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time today, for coming on the show. I just have two more questions for you. Good. So, given this whole journey in the restaurant industry, what are you most proud of? I think, really looking back, um, it was, I think someone explained it to me, a friend of mine, who also left, um, we worked together in the previous job. Um, his name is uh, Heine Boysen, and he was based in South Africa. So he left his his job to pursue an MBA program, and then he went back to South Africa and started um, one of the biggest delivery platforms there, Order In. Um, and he went through this uh, this typical life of an entrepreneur where obviously you have this you know burst of, amazing ideas and it sounds correct and the numbers are correct and the funding comes in and then you're hit by obviously the realities and you adjust and you go up and down so that was 
I faced a lot of that. I fa- definitely faced a lot of that. When, yeah. like I said, initially, you know, it was exciting. And then we were hit with the fact that obviously these franchise owners don't want to work the way we work. So picked myself up and did proper research. And all of a sudden we got excited about what this could potentially be. Started everything. Everything was fabulous. Great. Up until the moment where we were hit with the delays in construction. And that was a huge a huge uh, uh, dark part of my life yeah. um, and then eventually built ourselves up again and reopened it was a fabulous um, opening the first six months and then after that the reality again hit and we were down again so but just looking back I think one of the proudest moments was and this is obviously a lot of validation and I guess we all need some sort of validation. For sure. Right. For sure. Um, So when we were before, way way before we had a name, where we before created the name Boca or what we were going to serve and all of that in that first five slides deck that, that I had was the, a small little experience that we wanted to see. Cause that's what it was was all about. It was about the experience is that we wanted, we, we had the, I had a I had a I had a vision of um, of two people, bankers, lawyers, uh, coming into Boca in a, on a, like a late afternoon. They've missed lunch, uh, but they sat down and um, just sort of loosened up their tie or sort of just you know unbuttoned like a, a shirt or just and then ordered uh, a drink and a few tapas and sat on that terrace. I said, oh, "This is what we need," you know. What a, you know? There, everyone is in gray suits the whole day. Mm. And, um, you know, the first month after opening, it's exactly what we saw on the terrace. That's awesome. Is that two guys, two bankers walked in, there was another tie, ordered a drink, a few tapas. And that was, that was the moment. We thought, yeah. We did well, it. Well, your envision we came to reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. Obviously, it's a small thing because in the grand scheme of everything, yeah. that is really nothing. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was just great to see that, you know, a certain, something that you, you know, I, I never even knew how the restaurant was going to look like. Yeah. But I just had that feeling in mind that we wanted. And I think that's great is when you kind of do your homework and your work in the background and translates into a natural reaction to all of that. Not just one thing, but mm. everything coming together. Yeah. And then you have a reaction from the guest. And I guess this is this is part of what drives all of us in the industry. Yeah. Like that's what drives a lot of people. It's a very hard industry. It's long hours. It's hectic. It's physical. It's obviously mentally straining. But if you ask anyone in the industry, they will tell you it's because of moments like this, especially if you were involved in creating the ideas behind, you know, up until that moment. Yeah. So no, for sure. Yeah. That's an, that's an awesome, <laughs> that's an awesome story. And even like you said, even though it's maybe not the biggest, but the fact that you still remember no, it. For sure, for so sure. now yeah, it's probably the one that touches you, like, you know, for touches sure. you the most. Yeah. Um, Ahmad, for my last question, this is something I ask all my guests is what is the message that you'd like people to take home with them today? Um, I think it's, you know, I think it's something that is more um, proven to be something that like everyone will do right now is that it's something that I did this is back in 2011 when I left my previous stable job behind to explore. And obviously I was not that big risk taker. I obviously wanted to experience new things, but it was always calculated. Like I knew that, you know, for two years I've been working against this particular program that I wanted to get into. And I obviously didn't go by more. But then when I came back, I was like, you know what? I'm going to approach things with an open mind. In hindsight, that like thinking about it now, that could have been sort of very um, sort of uh, naive of me. Okay. Right? Interesting. Um, but, I, but I did it. I managed to get somewhere yes obviously you know whatever i'm making today is nowhere compared to what i was you know was doing back then it was much more stable things were um and i guess people have a chance to do something like this without necessarily i mean perhaps their force everyone's force is this year where thing you know the carpet has been sort of pulled, lifted, yeah. pulled from under everyone's feet and if there is a year that in five years from now, if anyone asks you about that gap in the CV in, in your in your CV in 2020, 
uh, people will understand. Like yeah. if you go from being, I don't know, an economist to uh, to open a, a, me- a mechanic shop, like to create, you know, fixing cars, no one's going to question that because this was the year where everyone was um, allowed to perhaps push a restart button and say, okay, what is really worth it? What does the world need right now? What do I want to do really? Yeah. Uh, obviously, there, everyone has their responsibilities and of challenges course, and course. things that you you want to um, achieve. But uh, perhaps this was this was the time and this is the year to sort of look at that. Yeah. Um, something that helped me, and I advise everyone to go. Something that really helped me at that point, and it was kind of um, it was a point when it was one of my darkest times when you know things were not going the way, the right way or yeah. the right direction or nothing was going the right way. Um, and obviously, I had to look back at what decisions have I have I made? Why have I why have I quit? Why, why am I yeah. right? Um, and there was a book at the time called The Hundred Year Life. Okay. Um, well, it's still there. It's a it's a it's a book written by an economist and a psychologist, and um, it talks about how we're living in totally different times. That we that we simply put just really quickly is that we no longer can follow the same path that our parents previous generations have lived in the sense that you know you go to school you go to university you get a job you get married you work in that job and you retire and then because you know we're statistically we're meant to live to be on average 100 years you know health is healthcare is improving everyone's taking care of themselves much better um so what are you going to do? You, can you, you can't retire at 60 anymore. What are we going to do for 40 years? Yeah. What, what, how, how is that going to sustain you? Mm. So now is the time. So what it's sort of, you know, the summary of all of this is that we live in the time where you're allowed to make jumps and changes. Education will continue, not just in your early years, but throughout your years. You're allowed to take time off to go and study and experiment and do different projects. Yeah. So that definitely helped me sort of calm down a little bit and calm down my anxiety in, in the sense that you know sort of i'm running out of time and yeah. i what have i what have i accomplished so far so it's okay to restart i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's a i totally agree with you and what you said because this year has kind of been the same for me in the sense i came back uh, from amsterdam i was looking for a job and then um covid came so of course no one was hiring and that's like you said that gave me the chance to like start this podcast and to now do like the other things I'm doing because no because there was no other like there was no other opportunity so I created like finally was doing something that I wanted to do and like you said it kind of gave you because if there was no COVID there might be some pressure you know from like around you like you should be getting a job not yet but now I think like you said correctly this year just like flip that whole script that whole switch and now you know if yeah. you have something that you always wanted to do, I admire that. Might be well a good done. time to do it. Well, thank well you. Done. Thank well you. Well Omar, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been an absolute pleasure. I learned so I had no idea about the restaurant industry. I think maybe I know no five percent, a little <laughs> bit more. So I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. and thank you so much for your time. Uh, guys, everyone listening, thank you so much. And as always, hope it helps. Peace. Thank you. Thanks.